Good afternoon. My name is Brian Carey, VP of Marketing here at Unbound Medicine. Thank you for joining us today as we present to you a series of short webinars titled COVID-19, Are We Getting Ahead? Today we will be discussing the latest in transmission. This pre-recorded presentation will last about 15 minutes. Please feel free to chat in the window provided and ask questions from fellow listeners. The recorded webinar will be shared with everyone via email within your ABX app in the message center, posted to Relief Central's coronavirus guidelines and uploaded to Unbound Medicine's YouTube channel. Now, please let me introduce our presenter, Dr. Paul Alwater. Dr. Alwater is the Sherilyn and Ken Fisher Professor of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, serving as the clinical director for the Division of Infectious Diseases and director at the Center for Environmental Infectious Diseases. He serves as the executive director of the Johns Hopkins Point of Care Information Pocket Center, producing the Johns Hopkins ABX, HIV, Osler, Psychiatry, and Diabetes Guides. In 2018, Dr. Alwater served as the president for the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the largest professional society worldwide related to infectious diseases. At this time, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Alwater. Thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you all for uh, joining in today. Uh, these uh, slideshow presentations are in shorter segments, so please um, pick and choose which ones which may be of interest to you or perhaps all of interest to you. So these are the uh, topics which we'll explore in the uh, separate webinars. So the coronavirus has certainly been in the news and for such a small particle that's not living has created tremendous havoc. And I think everybody is now aware of why this virus was named because of the protein spike projections from the lipid envelope of the virus shown here on electron microscopy, which looks like a crown or corona for coronavirus. But really it is the dramatic spread of this virus from first descriptions in December of 2019 to a global spread in both hemispheres that has really, I think, um, uh, uh, caught uh, so many people off guard, always predicting that influenza would be our next serious pandemic instead of the coronavirus, although we've had some dress rehearsals with SARS coronavirus 1 in 2002, and of course the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, uh, mers cov uh, in 2012, 2013, which still causes sporadic disease. But uh, the cases really now are so prominent in North America as well as Europe, uh, with the New York metropolitan area being the epicenter. Uh, we don't really know why, because other cities also have public transportation and are densely settled. Why New York City has such a higher rate of infection uh, and including into the suburbs. So this uh, doesn't remain with a completely satisfactory, satisfactory explanation, although density has been advocated. So the transmission though has really remained quite controversial because the thought initially by many was that the um, novel coronavirus is spread by respiratory droplet transmission identical to uh, most other respiratory viruses, influenza, or even the other coronaviruses that I've mentioned. And this is something where you've would uh, invoke the six foot rule, which you've heard about. And although surfaces can be contaminated uh, and perhaps a, a, a method of acquiring infection, it is not the airborne transmission as you might see in measles that seems to be uh, result in widespread distribution and, and simple inhalation of air where this is suspended could cause infection. Uh, other areas uh, potentially 
of note include uh, shedding of viral RNA in stool specimens, although it's not exactly clear how infectious this is yet, or the contribution. It doesn't seem likely that it's a perinatal infection, but that and other areas remain to be explored. But it's this debate between droplet and airborne transmission that truly uh, has caused uh, a lot of concern and anxiety. Now, because we do not have a vaccine or effective uh, therapeutics, really the social distancing, which was first um, uh, used in China and then also in Northern Italy and subsequently elsewhere, including in the United States, has really become the only way to decrease the r naught or the infectiousness of a given person with the virus. And it's a simple numbers game. If you're not seeing other humans or being near them, then it's much less likely you'll be transmitting the virus. And this uh, became very easily seen in a town in Italy where uh, they took strict and early measures in social uh, distancing compared to Bergamo, which uh, did not and had a much more rapid rise. And of course, the idea here is to flatten the curve, as it were, so that there is um, really an ability to handle this caseload. And of course, uh, even though there were some measures uh, in New York metropolitan area, um, really the health systems there were quite taxed, although we're beginning to see across the country benefits of the social distancing in many areas, although others are still quite experiencing the upswing. So the debate really uh, is interesting. I think uh, people have argued that there could be further spread beyond the typical droplet range, and whether that's truly aerosol or other uh, is an interesting question. Uh, I think there has yet to be a clear case of aerosol spread, as you might expect, uh, for example, in a building through ventilation or on an airplane and so on. But this has been very difficult to understand, in part because, on the other hand, a different explanation for this uh, dramatic and rapid spread is that this virus is successfully spread, in part because perhaps a very high percentage of people are without symptoms. We know that people in the first day or two before onset of symptoms shed the virus, but perhaps others are never ill and therefore can effectively transmit the virus to others and not realize it. There have been estimates voiced, I have not yet seen data by Bob Redfield of the CDC and then Anthony Fauci uh, from the NIH that think that up to 50% of uh, infected people may not have uh, symptoms. And so this asymptomatic carriage is really the X factor that remains quite unknown, whether the entire, I'm sorry, uh, X factor remains entirely unknown and really um, makes uh, uh, models and forecasts quite uncertain. So this is something that uh, remains unclear. Now, this study really has provoked a lot of, I think, attention in the press and, and stoked anxiety, I think unnecessarily, but I thought it was worth uh, discussing because I believe it gives a false impression about the capacity of the virus. This was a, a research letter published in the New England Journal, which used a nebulizer and an experimental drum generator for aerosols under ideal conditions for this virus, which was room temperature and 40% humidity, to see how long this virus could be suspended in air or remain on surfaces. And so uh, the, this purposefully made aerosol and found, not unsurprisingly, the virus could persist to some levels for up to three hours, uh, that on surfaces such as steel and plastic could last for three days or cardboard for up to a day. Now. <clears throat> I believe uh, the important points here are one, this is an experimental aerosol generation. So this is not generally uh, um, uh, applied in all situations. Two, these were ideal conditions and a virus that really does not like uh, neither heat nor humidity uh, probably would not persist as long. Lastly, uh, at least on the surfaces, this is only looking at uh, viral RNA. It is not a live or cultivatable virus, 
that we know. So I think uh, those are other important aspects to understand. So although this is interesting, it's experimental data, but I think people have not been very careful about reporting uh, these aspects and its implications, which I think probably mean people have overstated uh, issues. So uh, now the Centers for Disease Control have always taken a, a very conservative stance, uh, that is using airborne aerosol precautions. So therefore they've always recommended as in the right-hand side, the N95 respirator or higher, or uh, PAPRs, for example, along with a face shield and contact precautions. Um, but the WHO and others, such as the National Health on the left-hand side of the slide, have really just stuck with standard droplet precautions, meaning you could wear a surgical mask in most cases, and this should be sufficient along with gown and gloves. Uh, and only with aerosol generating procedures do you need to invoke the higher standard. Now, this has created a huge demand for N95s and supply problems have really forced the CDC to uh, voice um, uh, or make a change rather for an acceptable alternative. And you can see that on the right-hand part of this slide that is using a face mask, uh, which is really a surgical mask there instead. Um, and uh, I believe this is likely sufficient. Um, and this again gets to the aerosol and droplet debate. Uh, we know with the uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus that once healthcare workers uh, use droplet precautions that they really could effectively prevent themselves. And of course, this might not be the case with um, the SARS-CoV-2, but I, I think that would be unlikely. A couple of other changes, of course, were the moves to universal mask wear, uh, especially when you're in public settings or in close encounters with others. The idea here is that if you are an asymptomatic shedder, that even uh, talking and if you're not maintaining distance could predispose, for example, especially in grocery stores or other areas where you might unintentionally not be able to keep strict social distancing. Um, interestingly, Maryland, uh, New Jersey, and New York, as of today that I'm recording this, uh, April 16th, um, have made it mandatory to wear masks uh, when you cannot uh, be out alone outside. Uh, so um, I think there's a recognition that this may be one avenue to pursue. And of course, uh, many countries in Asia have been doing this for some time. Lastly, another change uh, for healthcare workers and other critical infrastructure workers are that if you're exposed to somebody with known COVID-19 or sus highly suspected, you're no longer uh, following the 14-day quarantine. Um, uh, so even if you've been in close contact, uh, that people can return to work. Of course, the issues here are that uh, there would have been uh, critical problems with uh, the workforce and aspects such as police, first responders, healthcare workers, and so on. So um, this, we're no longer trying to contain an epidemic because there's such widespread community exposure. So this is yet another change and I think more will likely follow. Uh, the key one being whether we need to maintain airborne precautions over time. So I thank you very much for listening and um, wish you well and staying safe. Uh, there's more information about our Johns Hopkins antibiotic guides that are regularly updated. And you can see here some of the contact information for questions. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Alwater. And thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. For more information about the Hopkins Guides, visit hopkinsguides.com. Also, we've opened all of the topics related to COVID-19 on the site, so that can be referenced from anyone, from any computer worldwide. If you have any questions about anything about the guides or about this webinar, please contact sales at unboundmedicine.com. Thank you so much, stay safe, and have a great day.